Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll probably stray away from the microphone. Can everybody still hear me if I'm standing over here? I talk fairly loudly. Um, thanks for inviting me here today. It's an exciting opportunity, and I look forward to uh, trying to uh, portray to uh, all of you what we're doing at West Wireless. And I thought hard and long about what I would talk about here, and I think what would be best if I portray to you what we see is the challenge, the real challenge facing us as uh, an engineering community and as a society level the challenges that we are faced with over the next 10 20 years and I think they're, they're they're rather large so we need to think about it so I call it re-engineering innovating healthcare beyond gadgets and gizmos and I think you'll understand by the end of the talk what I, I mean by that um, I work um, at West Wireless Health West Wireless Health um, is a uh, non not-for-profit institute that's over the road just from here, over near the glider port. You've probably all seen the building as you drive up Genesee. Um, and we're fairly young, and we're out to be disruptive, innovative, creative, and change what happens in healthcare. Um, I looked up innovation on Wikipedia, and uh, you know, it comes from a Latin word, and although the term is broadly used, it generally refers to creation of better or more effective products processes, technologies, or ideas that are accepted by markets of the global community. And it's more about major changes, positive changes, than incremental things. So we're talking about changing paradigms and not nudging things along little by little. Um, Medtronic is a company that's done innovation for many years, and these are just some of the things that Medtronic has done. So it's a good example of major things that a company has done to innovate, to change the medical world as we know it. Um, So West Wireless is an independent, not-for-profit research organization uh, that's based in San Diego and has been around since March of 2009, so we're relatively young. Um, and it was set up by Gary and Mary West, who made their money um, in the United States and felt very lucky to have been part of this wonderful country and been given the opportunity that they had, and realized what an incredible uh, overburden the healthcare system was beginning to be for small companies. So they want their legacy, one of the legacies to be, we help change the problems associated with the healthcare system and the burden that it's presenting to the society. So up to date, they've invested $100 million in the foundation, and our laser focus is changing the cost of healthcare. So that's, that's what we've been tasked with, and, and we're working hard to do that. Um, and in doing so, we're trying to tackle this medical device innovation or the medical industry innovation area. And this slide represents what's happened somewhat in the medical device innovation area uh, over the period of um, 85 to 2000. There were these huge increases in profits for medical device manufacturers. And then we hit around about 2000 with the economy the way it is, et cetera. And medical device innovations and profits and things have really leveled off and that represents a significant challenge as we'll see as we talk later on because people are saying, well, whereas this medical device industry was really exciting as an investment opportunity, it's no longer as exciting as it used to be and it's high risk. So that's one of the challenges. What are the core functions of the Institute? Well, the Institute has said, well, what are we going to do? Are we just going to go out and build new gadgets and offer them as new gadgets for people to use? And we don't think that's the only thing we have to do. We think that the things that we need to do to change the medical problem that we're facing is that we need to innovate, so we need to commit resources to develop meaningful inno innovations in the healthcare technology, not just the technologies, but the solutions and the business models. So we have to change the paradigm here somewhat. We need to validate. So one of the problems is, is specifically in the metal industry, is that you develop something, people don't, doctors are, are, are resistant to change, and rightly so, because they want to trust in the technology, trust in what's happening to make sure that they're offering uh, a quality product and a proper uh, quality resource to their patients. So we need to validate. We need to champion the clinical method validations of specific technologies. We're going to have to advocate. Advocate means changing some of the rules and the regulations and the things that go on in DC and other areas, because those are the drivers of what happens in industry. So we have a small advocation arm in DC where we're working with the FDA and the FC, other industry. Uh, that set rules and regulations. So advocation is important. We realize that we need to invest. So invest means that 
for all of these new young concepts and technologies if they don't get investment to help them through that valley of death where they need to uh, convert from being an idea into a profitable entity, then things aren't going to be able to succeed. I mean, everyone's aware of the problem in the economy, right? You can't turn on the TV right now or look at a web page without people talking about the economy, especially with the election coming up. Um, US public debt is projected to reach 62% of the economy. That's nearly double the historical average with a larger problem looming in the future. So we've got a real problem with our debt. Uh, for the US, one of the most poorly positioned, we're one of the most poorly positioned countries in the world, and addressing the long-term debt challenge must include prompt reform of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. This is from the Heritage Foundation, and over the next 20 years, the US will be, will experience the second highest projected increase of all of the G20 countries in healthcare and pension spending as a share of GDP. These are pretty staggering sorts of things. We're already in trouble, and, and it's, it's only going to get worse. So we're in the middle of this perfect storm. So we have uh, a global financial crisis. We have a certain aspects of the healthcare reform that are perhaps going to increase the costs. We have limitations on physicians and industry interactions. Uh, patient reform, certain aspects that are going to be problematic. Changes at the FDA, which are setting uncertainty within the industry. And uh, a broken reimbursement system. So we have this real perfect storm of problems that we're coming up against. Um, to paint, a, uh, paint this in a slightly different way, this, this graph here represents a percentage of the gross domestic product of federal spending here, Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. So back in 1982, you can see that Medicare and Medicaid is a pretty small fraction, but the projections under this model, uh, which comes from the Congressional Budget Office, is by 20, what is this? 82, we're up at a huge fraction of the GDP. That's, that's not good. Um, the other thing to note is unsustainable health care on the news. The statement that unsustainable health care happens every 20 seconds in the news right now. Um, and I'll just go through. These are some of the US long-term situations, one of the world's worst. Um, risk of crisis growing with higher debt levels. Uh, labels current US debt part unsustainable. Here we have Greenspan saying healthcare spending unsustainable. So it's all over the news. Everyone realizes that we have a problem with healthcare as it presently stands right now, and it's going to end up being worse. Um, the most important factor, so this is an interesting comment that, that I wanted to talk about. This is from the Congressional Budget Office, and their comment was that the most uh, important factor contributing to the growth in spending for healthcare in recent decades has been the emergence and adoption of widespread diffusion of new medical technologies. So they're saying that because we've invented these new technologies, the cost of care has gone up. Well, so is probably the quality of care. Right? MRI machine is a great machine, but it's expensive, and it's expensive to sit in that machine. So great new technologies, if it's not applied in the right way, is not going to reduce the cost of technology. You have to generate those technologies within the semblance of a system that's designed to reduce the costs associated with uh, delivering that technology. So just building new gadgets and widgets is not necessarily going to help us tackle the problem that we're up against. Status quo can't be sustained. Big problem most people aren't aware of. We don't have enough physicians right now, and it's only going to get worse. So we don't have... Uh, this plot here represents um, the percentage of shortfall in the number of doctors. Back here, we're at a, like a 30% deficit of the number of doctors that we really need. Um, and we also have a problem with the aging population. Talk a little bit about where we spend a lot of our money and where a lot of the sick people are. We have 20 million Americans with diabetes. 20 million with kidney disease, 50 million Americans have hypertension, 65 million Americans have cardiovascular disease, two out of every three Americans are overweight, and one in five are obese. One in five Americans over 40 will develop heart failure. Uh, and of all of these, of all of the chronic diseases, uh, they account for 90 to 6 percent of the spending that we spend in this country. So you just going to the doctor for your flu or your cold and stuff is nothing compared to the money we spend on the people who have chronic diseases. Um, and 75% of, of the overall US healthcare is accounted for in these chronic, chronic disease states. 
So to start with, the uh, Institute has said, we're going to tackle, first of all, the low-lying fruit, which is reactive. We're going to find the people who are highly motivated because of chronic disease, where most of the money is being spent in innovate around those areas because they're good target first areas. In the long term, we want to focus on being proactive. We want to stop people getting chronic diseases in the long term. But we, you want to start from where motivation is uh, initially. How, how much money is associated with these? Well, go down to diseases here. These are in billions of dollars here. Heart disease is a $65 billion a year uh, price tag. Anybody want to put their credit card down on that? Well, not only is the cost of the healthcare significant, but when you factor in the total lost economic output associated with these diseases, we're talking about um, $1 trillion sunk into these chronic disease states that this economy is supporting right now. And this is back in 2003, and it's, it's got significantly worse. Um, we have a problem with the grain population. It's not just us, it's just about every country. Um, some of these numbers are staggering. This is the percentage increase since 2000 to 2000, of the projected 2000 to 2020. Um, percentage age 80 or older is going to be up at around about 14%. Uh, 39% increase. So fundamentally though, when you look down here, we can see this is the percentage age 65 and older, 2.4% in 1980, 3.3 in 2000, 3.7 in 2020. So it's going up at an increasing rate. And if I go through to this plot here, which is more important, this one represents the number of potential workers per elderly person in eight of the major countries. So this is, when you're older, how many people are going to be working that are going to support the money it needs to keep you healthy? And back here in 1960, you can see Japan was doing great. They were 11 people for every one elderly. And now look over here in 2020, the projection is that there's only going to be two people supporting every elderly person. That's a staggering number. Um, the United States not doing a lot better. You can see every single country is trending along that map. So we must address the crushing cost of healthcare. This is a cost that now causes a bankruptcy in America every 30 seconds. We're going to make sure that Americans don't have to choose between a healthcare plan that bankrupts the government and one that bankrupts families. So healthcare and health issues bankrupt people all the time. Something that people aren't that aware of. The other thing is, it's not just our elderly that's the problem. It's our kids. Children sicker now than in the past, according to this Harvard report. Um, the number of American children with chronic disease has quadrupled since the time when some of the parents were kids. So in our lifetime, we've quadrupled the number of kids that have chronic disease. This is an epidemic in its own right that you can just see as that filters through the system is going to become completely unsustainable. So we have to do something proactively as we move through into this field as well. So reactive with the amount of money we're spending right now, but think about as we develop these solutions that are reactive, how do we transform those into solutions that are proactive? So what's the vision here? So the present state, we have chronic diseases, they're episodical, diagnosed, uh, intermittently uh, treated, and they consume enormous resources and uh, basically driven by exacerbations, clinical decompositions, and complications. So we get sick, really sick, we go to a hospital, they look after us, they send us home, we get really sick again, we go back to hospital. It's this cycle of uh, what we do right now. Whereas we believe the future state should be chronic diseases will be met with continuous care, improving outcomes and lowering costs by iterative course corrections, predictive and prevention of acute um, prescription. So what we mean by that is that We'll do remote monitoring, we'll understand what's happening with your disease state, we'll train those disease states, and we'll intervene when necessary to keep you from coming back to hospital. So this continuous versus this intermittent remote management. And we believe a path there is by near, on, or in body sensor technologies providing actionable diagnostic information 
linked to learnable learning systems that titrate therapies and enable continuously control our controlled feedback to the individual. So quite a paradigm shift between what we're doing and what we'd hope to do, and the path to that is fraught with problems and innovations and challenges for all of us in this room. So let's replace the costly intermittent rescue with continuous and cost-effective care. Some examples, um, we have already have implantable pacemakers and defibrillators that are in people nowadays. Not that I'm going to sign up to have one put in myself, unless I'm extremely motivated. <laughs> we have uh, big companies like GE making statements that um, this certain country here is the opportunity to be the leader in creating small medical devices to enable treatment of chronic diseases in homes instead of hospitals. You cannot treat those people in hospitals, you have to treat them at home because of the aging population, this could be the economy that develops devices in the future. Making big statements, what, what's the country? Well, they believe that Japan is the country that needs to pioneer, and it wasn't surprising, remember back to that slide, Japan is going to have two people supporting every elderly person in the not too distant future. So um, there are a lot of people thinking about this problem here. So this is a little video that might stop you and think. It's a little humorous, it's a little long, but I think it drives home, and hopefully it will work, but it drives home, you know, really the folly of our present medical system. Hello, thank you for calling AR Healthcare, the airline that works like the healthcare system. My name is Cynthia. How can I give you travel care today? Hi, my name is Jonathan Rausch, and I need to fly from Washington, D.C. to Eugene, Oregon on October 23rd. Yes, I'd be happy to assist you with that. It does look like we can get you on a flight on January 23rd at 1 p.m. or February 8th at 3 p.m. Which would you prefer? Neither. I need to be in Eugene on October 23rd, as in... I'm sorry, we have nothing open on that date. You, you might try another carrier. Is that better? Um, who has availability? I'm afraid we have no way to know that. I have no way to look into their systems. Uh, who would know? You can call them individually and ask. I'm sure you can find them. Oh, look, I don't, I don't have time to call two dozen airlines. Uh, it's important that I get to Eugene on the 23rd. I mean, there must be something you can do. Um, well, it, it looks like maybe we could squeeze you in on October 26th if you don't mind departing Washington Dallas at 5.35 a.m. Good grief. Uh, all right. I guess that Great. Thank you. I'll be happy to make that booking for you. Um, that's one flight from Washington, Dallas to Chicago. O'Hare on October 26th. Wait, wait. Okay, hold on. Ch else? Chicago? I'm, I'm going to Eugene. It's, it's in Oregon? Yes, sir. The Eugene portion of your trip will be handled by a Western specialist. We'll be glad to bring you back from Chicago to Washington. Now. You mean I have to call another carrier and go through all this again? Why don't you just book the whole trip? Sorry, sir, but you will need to make your own travel appointments. We would be happy to refer you to some qualified carriers. May I have your fax number, please? Before I can confirm the booking, we'll need you to fill out your travel history and send that back to us. Cynthia, I, I've filled out my travel history half a dozen times already this year. I've told, I've told six different airlines that I, that I flew to Detroit twice and Houston once. Every time I fly, I answer the same battery of questions. At least, a do at least a dozen airlines know my travel history. Why don't you get it from them? We have no way we could do that. We do not have access to other companies' records, and our personnel have our own system for collecting travel history. Yeah, but 95% of these questions are always the same. I mean, don't you know that every time I fill out one of these duplicative forms, I increase the chance of error? Wouldn't it make more sense to hold my travel information centrally so that everyone could see the same? Sorry, sir, we have no capability for that, and we do need your travel history at least two weeks before you fly. I don't suppose I could fill out these forms online. No, sir. The forms are only 30 pages, though. Did you have that fax number, please? I don't have a fax machine. No one faxes anymore. Just, just email me. I'm sorry, sir. We don't use email to transmit records and other personal or secure documents. We keep our records on paper. What century is this? I mean, you think paper is secure? We do keep all your travel records on low acid paper and in fire retardant file drawers. When someone needs access to your records, we make a photocopy of it and put them in the mail. Or fax. How many items of luggage were you wanting to bring? Two. Okay, good. We suggest that you make luggage arrangements with rapid air transport, though of course you're free to use any luggage company you like. 
Luggage company? Uh, yes, sir. You need to arrange for baggage transport. Would you like a phone number for Rapid or would you prefer to find your own baggage company? I'm sure Rapid would be pleased to work with you. All you need to do is sign the personal travel records release form. Where would you like me to mail that? A release form? Yes, sir. You'll need to sign and fax or mail that back to our travel records department so that we can release your travel records to Rapid. Under the privacy rules, we're not authorized to tell them when or where you're flying without your written permission. I suppose I couldn't just email you this permission or, or grant it online? No. Did you want a list of luggage carriers for your Chicago Eugene leg? Well, let me guess. Rapid doesn't operate out west? I have to I have to find a separate luggage company for the second leg? Yes, sir. Uh, and, and they'll need more copies of the same paperwork? And they'll ask me all the same questions and I'll have to arrange to get my travel records to them by mail or fax? And I'll repeat all this nonsense five or six separate times between here and Eugene because the providers aren't equipped to talk to each other, my records aren't digitized, and no two providers use the same system. Yes, sir. That's right. Do you have a preferred fuel list, or did you want a reference for a company to provide fuel details Fuel list. Like a flight? That would be a fuel specialist, I suppose? We can make a fuel arrangement for you, but please be advised that the fuel is charged will be built separately and that you will be responsible for that. We'll need to know where to have that bill sent. May I have your flight insurance information, please? Um, yeah, um, it's a Millennium Travel Group, uh, group number um, 0688. I'm sorry, sir. We're not in Millennium Travel Care's provider network. You're listed on their website. It says you accept We money. did until last week. If you like, you can pay out of pocket for your ticket. How much would that be? Uh, yes, sir. I'll be happy to get that price for you. Uh, that would be... $17,885. What? For a flight to Chicago? Does anyone actually pay I'm that? sorry, sir. I wouldn't know. I can tell you that different clients and insurers pay different rates. For individuals, the rate is $17,885.70. Oh. Plus tax and fuel. Is anyone else cheaper? Sir, again, I couldn't tell you that. Carriers don't have public rate sheets. Prices are privately negotiated, so there's really no way you could compare some shops. Anyway, I'm going to stop it there, but I think you get the general picture. Has anybody felt that frustration with the healthcare system here? Like, you know, you go to the doctor and you think, well, I have insurance. Is this MRI going to cost me $10,000 because it, it hasn't been covered by my insurance? You, you never know, right? Mm -hmm. I had a friend that went to the emergency department just recently, the, the critical care, and he got the bill handed to him and he called them and he said, well, you actually saw an internist and it wasn't really a doctor, and that's not covered. So he goes, what? I didn't see a doctor. So it, it just exacerbates the problem. So it's not just, this, this video is good because it's not just devices that are the problem. It's the bigger picture. It's the electronic medical records. It's the information flow. It's all of the different parts in the system that don't seamlessly work together that enable us to do what we really all think is something that should be pretty simple. So there's lots of parts within the medical system when you stop and think about that need innovation. Okay? So that's, I think that brings that one home reasonably well. So we like to think of infrastructure in independence. So what we just saw there was a broken infrastructure. Information can't flow people get frustrated and it's not just on our side of the telephone that people get frustrated. You can imagine being the woman that gets barraged <coughs> by all of us every day. How come my medical number, medical record stuff isn't shareable, etc. So right now we have low frequencies of visit, acute care focused, appointment driven, uh, location centric and high cost and we believe high touch, right treatment, when they need it, where they need it at lower cost is, is one possible solution. Um, and you know, this kind of works elsewhere. It's, we're not just talking something unique here. We put sensors right now over all of our bridges, or a lot of bridges. And we do it because we don't want catastrophic failure that happens to the bridge system because it's expensive. So we have a, a good example here of an industry where they put strain sensors and they look at the, the degradation of infrastructure pieces that seems to work and is cost beneficial. We do it in our cars, right? Our cars now are smarter than us. We have sensors in the car that detect how far away the next car is. We have sensors that detect, I have a little thing on my dash panel telling me how much uh, air I've got in my tires. Mm -hmm. We have little black boxes in some cars right now that are recording everything that we do in the car and they're gonna be used against us in a court of law if you're not careful. It brings up another privacy issue that I'll talk about a little bit later. So, we put sensors to ensure safety in lots of our systems right now. We don't do it on the humans very well. 
So can't we do the same thing that we do for our other infrastructures, for our cars, for our buildings, for the human being? Whether or not that's implantable sensors, whether or not it's sensors in your clothing, whether or not it's sensors in your bed, let's think about enabling sensors to measure and ensure safety of human beings. Um, this is a company, Be Close, it's one of the ones that we pulled off the net. And these, this is a company that's actually doing something like this. They have sensors right now uh, that they're rolling out in people's homes, monitoring what the elderly are doing in the home, where they're going in their place, what they're doing, and feeding that information back to the kids and providing information to people about what's going on in the homes. So it's an example of some of this technology that's starting to, to be rolled out under different models. Um, and there are some drivers for change here. There is payment reform, uh, aligned incentive versus fees based for service. So this shifts from volume to value in healthcare of delivery. Uh, accountable care organizations, bundled payments, uh, medical home, and hospital readmission rules. A good example of this is that right now there's a law change coming down. Law change states that if I'm a care provider or a hospital, and for congestive heart failure patients, which was a really good business to be in if you were a hospital. So congestive heart failure patients get a build up of liquids in their body and they have to come back to the hospital sometimes regularly, like once every month. And that's great for the hospitals. They give you a service and in a month's time they come back and they give you another 15,000 or $20,000 procedure. So really good business. But that, so we're gonna have a, a rule change now. The rule change says, if your percentage of people coming back we have missions within 30 days is above a threshold, we're going to tax you. Not just on your congestive heart failure stuff, but on your whole revenue base. So hospitals are now panicking because now it's no longer a great um, market for them. They wouldn't even talk to us a year ago. Now they're all over us. Help us here. So it's a good example. A law change, changing the way that people look at the medical system is driving an innovation. The innovation is how do I stop these patients getting sick again? Shouldn't that have been the question to start with? Rather, how do I make more money? The realization for all of us is though, a lot of these care systems are driven by how much money am I going to make out of the market? That's a challenge for all of us as we think about technologies and what we do here, and particularly a challenge for West Wireless and the community because we're trying to remove money from the equation. Um, and healthcare innovation is enabled by convergence of pervasive technologies. So here's the wireless health. Who's heard of mHealth, eHealth, all of those sorts of things? We've all heard the waves coming, right? Well, it's not quite here yet, and we need all of your help to make it actually happen. So the idea is I have a patient here, we collect data, we wirelessly somehow communicate it to another point which goes across some other data transmission path to a cloud computing or some system that extracts, analysis, analyzes the data and pushes that information to the physician. So great concept, we've all bought into it, we all love the idea, lots of challenges to get there. Um, you know, a lot of the pieces are already here. So we already have lots of sensors. We have Wonderful wireless connectivity. You can just about, I was just down in the Yucatan in Mexico, right, out in the middle of nowhere, and I got 3G cell phone coverage at these little clinics that were around. Cloud computing, we're, you know, it's coming back. Cloud computing's everywhere. Apple's got theirs. Everyone's rolling out with these cloud computing things. And how many people here are on Facebook or Twitter or everywhere? Is anyone here not on Facebook or Twitter or one of these social networks? We have no. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so we're, we're all part of this, this social networking thing, which is probably a good thing for this industry. Because we've got to think about if I come up with, if I come up with a metric that says Joe Blow over here is not taking his medication, how do I deal with that? So we've got this wonderful information now, and it says he's not taking his medication. How do we deal with that? What's the best way of dealing with that? Is a, is a call from your doctor saying, oh, you're not taking your medication, the right thing to do? Or is a call from the son saying, hey, Dad, I'm really worried about you? So how do we deal with these things is another place to innovate around. What are we going to do? How are we going to deal with that? So we have all these wonderful improvements in technology that are at our fingertips that weren't available 10, 20 years ago. So, pervasive technology enables coordinated care. Remote monitoring, care not limited to the doctor's office or the clinic or the ER. 
not just when you can get an appointment. I've been continually frustrated with the system in this country. You ring up to get an appointment and it's in three months' time. You think, well, geez, I'm going to forget about the appointment if you give it to me in three months' time, let alone the fact that I'm sick. <laughs> um, expert time, uh, care on an ongoing basis versus during routine office visits. Let's find out when a person's really starting to get sick and do something about it before they get pneumonia. Uh, I had a visit a couple of years ago where they said, you don't need to come to the clinic, it's just the flu or something, stay in bed. And a week later, I actually had pneumonia. So, you know, the system really doesn't help itself. Um, and really, we believe that's heading towards what we believe is infrastructure independence. Um, right care at the right time where you are. Ten initial targets for wireless medicine. So these are some of the big money spinners. Uh, Alzheimer's, asthma, breast cancer, COPD, uh, depression and mood disorders, diabetes, heart failure, hypertension, obesity, and sleep disorders. So you can see the sorts of numbers of people. And some of the metrics that you know, we may be able to measure as uh, a community to give insight into what's happening here. Um, some people anticipate by 2014 we're going to have 400 million wireless sensors worn by people in some shape or form. That's more than one per person in the United States. Some examples, there are monitors out there right now for diabetes that are doing some great stuff in measurements and wireless communications. There are some, uh, here's cardio names, they have little uh, pressure monitors, that they're implantable pressure monitors that measures change in the pressure throughout the cardiovascular system that can, they can use for diagnostics. Um, drug delivery is a huge problem. Drug compliance, and I know a speaker here in the audience today that they're doing something along those lines, but drug compliance is a problem. Um, you know, we're all aware of how difficult it is to remember just to take your vitamins and stuff. It's the same true of people taking drugs, and side effects can be a problem. So drug compliance is an issue, especially for congestive heart failure patients, which is one of our target areas. How do we keep people on their medication? We do it for epilepsy for patients. We implant so epileptic patients are really motivated, a great initial audience. That's why a lot of companies go after them. Because if I have an epileptic seizure while I'm walking down the road, I can fall over, hit my head, and seriously injure myself. So anything that they'll cotton on to just about anything that can improve their condition. So there's implantables that measure the onset of a seizure that zap the brain. There are external ones that sense the, and zap the vagal nerve. So as an example of a motivated industry, um, there are a lot of these biosensors, pressure sensors, you can see how small they're getting. Um, some great innovations, little pressure monitors. A lot of work being done on developing small, right down to the nano-sized uh, sensor technologies. Uh, and you know, here's a science fiction picture, but I don't think we're that far away from these sorts of technologies. So uh, we're, we're getting there. I saw an article just recently where they had a molecular-based machine of some description. They were doing some demonstrations on great technologies, but they need innovation on bringing those technologies into a market that's going to change something else. And I'll talk about those barriers shortly. Um, there are also some really cool hidden solutions right now. What do I mean by hidden? So. Um, this group has got this little invisible tattoo for diabetes patients. So they put this invisible tattoo on your arm, you grab your cell phone, you put it over it, and it reads out your, your diabetes uh, number. You can determine the of your self-injection. No pricking of your finger anymore, you have this invisible tattoo. Isn't that a cool solution? Yeah. And the one I like about this is that I believe that the, the, the problem of compliance, which is the huge hurdle for us to be challenged with right now, compliance of people doing something to be proactive rather than reactive is a huge hurdle for us. So this is a really cool story. <coughs> um, another little video. This one's much shorter. A team of scientists led by University of Illinois professor John Rogers has created a new, less intrusive way of gathering data from the human body. Unlike conventional equipment that hardwires patients to a stationary machine, the epidermal electronics, as they're called, attach to the skin in the same way you would attach a temporary tattoo. Our thought was that 
if you could convert the electronics from the rigid boxy form that it exists today into a format that looks like the skin in terms of mechanical properties, uh, shape, uh, stretchability, toughness, uh, then you could almost make like a second skin that would laminate on the surface of the uh, biological skin in a completely seamless, integrated fashion uh, that would be essentially invisible to the user, but able to deliver all of this kind of new functionality through the skin. So the trick is, how do you go from a rigid silicon wafer-based type of electronics, which is the dominant form of electronics today, into an electronics that offers those same kind of performance or operating characteristics, but in the format of a tissue-like or skin-like form? Researchers developed S-shaped circuits that can move with the skin, expanding, contracting, and twisting without affecting performance. Through this technology, the team has been able to demonstrate a variety of devices on the electronic platform, including EMG sensors, LEDs, and solar cells. Other demonstrations have shown the wearers controlling video games. Uh, the kind of functioning systems that we uh, demonstrated in this paper uh, involve devices that can monitor brain function, so they laminate onto the forehead and they can monitor brain waves and determine you know, certain aspects of brain activity. So uh, since the uh, characteristic of our device is very similar with academics, if we cover it with conventional uh, temporary tattoo, uh, first of all, other people cannot see it. So it is uh, very easy to wear. And since we are using wireless system, uh, the patient or people can move uh, and do normal life without any restriction. We can recover high quality signals in this kind of skin-like epidermal system uh, that are comparable to uh, state-of-the-art uh, conventional electrodes that involve bulky uh, pads strapped to the skin. So the fidelity of the measurement is, uh, is equal to the best uh, existing technology that's out there today, but in this very unique skin-like form. Who thought that was cool? Brilliant new technology um, with lots of barriers ahead of it. But um, it's an inspiring thought about how do we translate these things? How do we make them very non-invasive for people to wear and to use? And I've called this metal invasiveness. You still have to do something, right? Your skin sheds, it's going to shed off. It's fledgling technology, but very interesting. As we move forward, you want to get to a system where you don't do anything. I don't have to have a tattoo on it. My environment is Star Trek. Infers <laughs> from subspace what's happening to me. But um, really intriguing, innovating technologies that people are pushing forward on. Um, this is an early stage industry with huge potential. Um, you saw the staggering amounts of money in the previous slide spent on healthcare. Um, and it's on this backdrop of this unsustainable healthcare system. Uh, there's been increased recognition of the wireless healthcare opportunity that we have been talking about for 10 years that requires risk capital to build the potential, that in turn requires regulation, regulatory clarity and timeliness, and that then requires a rational business model. So the one thing I want everybody to take home to think about here from today is that as we do things as engineers and entrepreneurs is to remember at the end of the day if we want to be successful, whether or not it's to make a lot of money or change healthcare, you have to have a model that makes sense. Not just the technology in the middle, but the unmet need and the way that you implement it that people want to use. So it's important to realize that um, everything's important. And it's important to realize as engineers and leaders in the engineering community to bring your thinking to bear on all of those problems. They all need innovation. We've got some significant barriers. Um, venture risk capital follows real business opportunities. Right? So if you don't have a good business model and a good rationale for them to invest in that they can see low risk, they're not going to invest in it. So it's a real problem. Um, reimbursement issues are being resolved around some of these cost pressures. Remember I talked about congestive heart failure. Hopefully as those things change, it's going to motivate people to innovate and invest in this area because they see it as a potential for a successful business. 
Not only is the congestive heart failure patient a good one, but we're tending towards these models where as a care provider, I'm given so much money to manage your condition. That's it, that's what I get. So I'm now motivated to make sure I spend as little money as possible on you. So there's a good motivator there. Um, regulatory, we have some real problems regulatory. There's this clarity, keeping R&D investment on the slide lines. Investors don't know what's happening. You know, one of the big horrible things about developing drugs are the huge clinical trials that you have to do on the drugs to show that they're safe, etc. So not knowing in the medical device industry whether or not your app on the phone is going to have to go through a clinical trial that's going to cost you $10 million is a huge risk for an investor. So getting clarity on what the requirements are for what you're doing from a regulatory is really important. West Wales is working in DC to try and help identify some of those things and work with groups on working some of those out. Privacy is a big one and I'll, I'll show you something a little bit later on. Uh, clarity with consistent interruption and guidance. You know, we all want privacy with our data, but we all want the data to get to the right people. Liability. You remember I talked about the black box on the car? When they put those in the cars, they guaranteed the data would never be used against you. And now they're showing up in courts being called as data for people to sue other people. So liability is a big one that we're going to have to cross as a community to deal with. Uh, another big barrier is interstate medical practices. So if I get data on you and transmit it across to the call center in another state, they can't use doctors in that state that aren't licensed in this state to actually diagnose your condition. So a huge problem if we're going to do this remotely with the logistics of dealing with the data and who analyzes the data and makes uh, predictions. And you know, we have an entrenched healthcare establishment, so shifting from the hospitals and the physicians to this remote stuff is going to be painful, and we're going to have to work with the thought leaders on this side as well as the thought leaders on, the, on our side to, to bring this through. Uh, as I said, this clarity in the regulations, we really need to uh, define regulatory pathways that can help uh, manufacturers and researchers understand what the hurdles really are going to be. Um, we've been through all of these sorts of things. What are we going to do? We, you know, we have forms that we need to fax, we saw the video, can we transmit them electronically? How do they have to be encrypted? Who gets hold of the data? Where are they stored? Where are the decision support systems? Yeah. Lots of barriers here for us to innovate around. Um, some good news though, uh, there have been some innovations showing positive traction. So VHA care coordinators, which is a home telehealth, have shown a 19% reduction in hospital readmissions and an average cost of home care of $1,600 compared to uh, $77,000 for uh, nursing care. Huge reduction. Community care in North Carolina, Estimated savings for 2006 were 150 to 170 million dollars relative to what the state would have spent under previous models. Um, Garzinger Proven uh, Health Navigator Medical Home Initiative have shown uh, 20 to 18 percent reductions in the costs. So people removing that side of care from the traditional to more remote are showing significant uh, traction, which is which is good news. Um, Here's uh, a, another sign of great things. So here's uh, an implantable defibrillator that whilst he transmits data to the patient from the uh, patient's heart function, reduced in-hospital evaluations by 45%. So they happen to have an invasive technology that's collecting data right now for other reasons, but the data there is showing huge improvements in uh, the uh, in-hospital stuff. Uh, cardio man is here. The idea is to detect changes in In a sense, before the patient has uh, to be in hospital, the rise transmit results 30% reduction in hospitalization from heart failure patients. So these are huge. Remember those numbers? We were talking about tens of billions of dollars for these conditions. So collecting data before things happen, alarming on them, can have large changes in outcomes. Uh, a couple of other lessons from history um, about things need to get really bad or perceived bad before people do things. In 1898, delegates from across the globe gathered in New York City for the world's first international urban planning conference, and a big topic that dominated discussion was not housing, land, or economic development, but uh, desperation about horse manure. So the predictions were that, this is in 1894, that estimated 
1950, every street in the city would be buried nine feet deep in horse manure. So people got really worried. <laughs> so this drove innovation and people to be concerned and changing things. So. Uh, some other, other lessons are that people have always been this worried about the population and its substance and it, uh, whether or not we can sustain population. People worry about what's happening. Once again, back to the slide, how do we be disruptive, innovative, creative? How do we do these things? Um, it's time to deliver. Uh, 10 years is too long. People are going to wonder whether M Health is ever going to happen. We need to start doing things now. Um, we have a threatening, unfavorable demographic, unsustainable healthcare delivery model, um, and we need to do these things. So this is really, I would suggest to you, this is an irresistible opportunity for a revolutionary change in the way that we care for patients when we do things. And you guys are right in the middle of it. You have the opportunity to be part of a wave that is really going to be exciting and interesting and change the world for the better. And it's got to happen. If we don't do it, it's not going to happen. Um, and, you know, all of these wonderful changes that we're being part of, you know, the cloud computing, increasing in computing power, rapid changes in technologies, and the change in the way we're thinking about doing healthcare is how we'll do it. Cell phone modification has happened so quickly and so rapidly. It shows how fast innovation can happen. The new model in business is that you have to innovate within a year if you're going to be a successful company. You need to take that concept and turn it into a real device in about a year, whereas before it was like five years. How do we do it in a year? How do we do things this rapidly? I'm always amazed about TVs and cameras, right? There's a new camera coming out every six to 12 months. Yeah. I'd hate to be on that production line. <laughs> but we've got to do the same thing for healthcare if we're going to be successful. It can't be 10, 20 years before we bring new technologies to the fray here. We have to act quickly. Um, this is an interesting one. So, you know, barber shops back in the old day would be probably the place you got your teeth pulled. You'd go in, you'd get your hair cut, and they'd pull the back molar because it was decaying. So there's this little study now where they were actually getting blood pressure monitored. I forget which state it was in. Uh, African Americans were getting their blood pressure monitored at the barber shop. And then the barber would say, you know what? Your blood pressure is not looking so good. You need to go up to the doctor. An interesting model. And they showed some interesting statistics on um, the reduction in um, some one of the chronic diseases that's associated with that plan. So let's do these things where we have sites of care. Let's, let's change things up. I know dentists right now are being proactive on obesity. They're measuring the weight of children as they come in, as part of the dental things. Mm -hmm. In summary, um, about what we've just seen, the state of the healthcare today, here we are here, hooked up to an ATM, piping money through to the system. <laughs> we have rising costs, demographic challenges, and shortage of doctors, right? So, and the desired future state, let's go from this present state to the future state where we're doing things remotely and use the sensor technologies and the remote access that we have. So West Wales Hill, what's our process? How are we thinking of dealing with these issues? And instead of just thinking, well, we're, you know, this is a nice challenge. I'm a sensor guy. I've built sensors all my life, and sensors and gadgets are cool. We need to think about the bigger picture because we want to be successful. We desperately want to change the system. And to do that, we need to think about the whole picture. So first thing first, you need to think about what's the unmet need? Who owns the unmet need? Huh? Who, who's motivated to change that unmet need? It's no good someone saying, yeah, I have an unmet need, and you say, well, if I build this for you, will you buy it? No. no. <laughs> or worse, yeah, I have an unmet need, will you, build, will you buy it if I build it for you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, here it is. No, I don't no. want that. I can't <laughs> that, right? So we really got to think about what's the unmet need, do the people want it solved, and then believe in their rationale for why they think they want it solved. Because if they don't have a motiv motivator at the end of the day to solve the problem, they're probably not going to buy what you've got. I, I worked for a company once that built um, baggage scanning technologies. And it's an interesting industry because the airlines don't really care whether the planes fall out of the air, get blown up. What they care about is how much money it costs to inspect my bag to meet the regulatory process. Because planes typically don't blow up, they're pretty safe. So that's their driver. Their driver is how much money does it cost me? So we built this great new technology that would find explosive hidden in, in bag by their chemical signature. Mm -hmm. Had an agreement with a company that turned around and said, no, we don't care. 
So we invested all of this money, we got a contract, at the end of the day, they weren't motivated to use it because there wasn't a rationale. So we should have thought up front, why are they gonna use our technology? We're more expensive than what they're doing right now, but we've got better statistics. So you've got to think through, what's the unmet need? And you need to do it with your medical providers, the people who are actually providing the service that are paying the money. So once you've got your unmet need, then you need to think, well, what's my solution? So does that mean that we take our engineers and we sit around a table and we say, well, what cool technology we can apply to that? Sure, we could do that. But we'll probably come up with a narrower picture of a real solution. What we need to do here is to sit around with the medical providers, the people who say they have the problem, the entrepreneurs who say, well, yeah, but what's the model, business model here? I'm not going to be a part of that. The clinicians, the engineers, um, everybody in the process that cares about this. Bring them all together and, and actually collide those ideas at one spot and one place and come up with a solution that we all think makes sense. So we're being very proactive on bringing groups together and ideating around the unmet needs. Once we've got an unmet need, a solution that we think, hey, this solution is really cool. Everyone thinks it's cool. And we think it's going to lower the cost of healthcare. Then we need, uh, we do focus technical risk reduction and rigorous testing. So here, we pull apart a problem to its fundamental pieces and we say, how do we innovate around this? And do it in a such a way that we lower the cost. An example on a project that we're running right now, Sense for Baby, which is a cardiotopography system, uses ultrasound, is that we took the conventional team and find, uh, we take those solutions and we push them out to industry. Licensing the technology or doing a spin out or something like that. And most importantly is engage early for long-term success. The, the customers, the medical providers, the entrepreneurs and the investors. Don't get, a, don't, don't get over here and then talk to your investor the, 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 this, the last day of your process. Right? Ask the investor up front, look, we're in this industry. Do you guys see this as something you're interested in? If you can have all of those people engaged here and operate through part of the process, you're much better off. So that's the process by which we're moving things through. Present efforts, sense of value I just talked about. So, um, you know, if any of you want to come across, you can email me, come across to the Institute, we'll show you some of the technologies, I'll give you a tour around. Okay. Um, Sensor Baby is a cardiotopography system, so it has an ultrasound here that measures heart rate, and it has a sensor here that measures strain, which measures uterine contractions. And the idea here is that one of the larger money spenders is uh, premature births. It costs us a huge amount of money to manage premature births. So the idea here is that we can provide a system that provides more remote monitoring of the fetal health and what's going on here in stress, and this is one of the standards of care in that area. Uh, we're presently getting ready to deploy this with the Carlos Slim Institute in Mexico. Uh, I was just down there last week and put it into clinics to help with the huge number of births that they have in that area. And you know, right now, in that area of the world, they're monitoring heart rate with a little aluminum tube and putting it against the mother's stomach. That's the level that they do it. So we're trying to change things by developing really cheap technology there. Now, the area that we're working on is this infrastructure independence. And the idea here is that um, you know, you go into a hospital with your device and it doesn't communicate to that thing over there because that's using brand Y's communication protocol. And I go down here and it's using brand Z's protocol and I go over here. So we've got this dysfunctional infrastructure. You know, I buy Philips systems, so you can only come into this hospital if you've got Philips stuff, or I've got this. So we're trying to work on breaking down this, this infrastructure problems by doing infrastructure independent so medical grade wireless is this idea that we've brought together this council of uh, hospitals, CIOs and CTOs from hospitals, and they're saying, look, you've got a lot of power. If we team you together and you come up with saying, this is the standard, this is what we want to do wirelessly in our hospitals. This is how we want to see this operate. And we have a standard that people use and a methodology of how to roll that out in a hospital. Right? Then they've got a lot of power to go to people like Philips and the other places and say to them, look, this is what we want done. You need to follow these rules if you want to operate in a hospital. And they've got a lot of power to drive those things. So we're trying to bring those groups together to help drive uh, infrastructure independence. We want to commoditize getting data from point A to point B. We want it to be really cheap. One of the biggest barriers for young companies when they start breaking into this is saying, gee, I'm going to do wireless. What does that mean? Do I use Ant or Bluetooth or Zigbee or this or that? How do I do that? 
What about security of data? Do I need to encrypt? How, how do I do that? What do I do? So we're trying to help in that area. We're trying to you know, bring together some formalizations that companies can come to us or hopefully eventually become ubiquitous that there are these solutions that they can just pick up that are cheaper than to do. There's some of the things that we're doing. So what do we need for our next generation of engineer leaders? And these are just some light thoughts. We need continue to think out of the box. That's what you're taught to do, right, somewhat. You've got to think out of the box to innovate, to do new things. Think out of the box, and not in your comfort zone, right? So think about these other business challenges. Even as the engineer, you should be challenging yourself and the people you're working with. Hey, what's, what's the unmet need for this? Can you tell me who my customer is? Can I talk to the customer? Can I find out what the customer's real concerns are? So get, get uncomfortable with the questions you ask. Get, get, get out of that comfort zone that I work on doing firmware for an MSP430 and that's what I do. Push the boundaries. If we can do that as we've worked to, as a group to do that, we're all going to be better off. Um, innovation in medicine doesn't just mean neat new devices. You can innovate on process, you can innovate on communication protocols, you can innovate at lots and lots of spots, and we need innovation in every area. Um, every area along the cycle. We need to re-engineer the whole delivery system, not just the sensors. Okay? We need to do at-home monitoring, we need to do all of those things. Uh, and I believe the future is proactive care, not reactive care. But to get there is going to be long. So we're starting with, with reactive right now, with in mind that proactive is where we need to be. Um, for adoption of these pervasive remote technologies, I think there's a lot of barriers that we're going to have to tap, uh, deal with. Infrastructure and compliance independence. You know, people are too busy as it is. I barely remember to charge my cell phone at night, right? Because I've got so many other things. You come up, God, I've got to find a charger. Where is that? You know, so you've got to find these things to do. If we say to them now, well, when you get home, you have to hop on the scale, and then after you hop on the scale, prick your finger, and then after you do that, urinate in this cup, and do the sensor. Go, People aren't going to do it. You know, we're, we're too busy as it is. So um, we've got to deal with this compliance and this infrastructure independence. We've got to make it really simple for people. We've got to make it so simple that I just don't know what's happening until I get this little feedback to me telling me, look, Rob, you need to do something here, dude. Okay. So um, context is really important. You've got to start thinking about context. So I go to the, and I'll give a good example. I go to the hospital, I'm laying in the bed, and I've got a pulse oximeter on my finger reading my blood oxygen level. And it drops to eight, from 92 to 85, and then an alarm goes off. Good reason. I'm in a hospital and my oxygen level is really low. I know the context. So now I put one on a patch that's on my chest, and I'm running around and doing things great, and I hop in a plane, and when I hop in a plane, my blood oxygen goes to 80, just because there's less oxygen when you're up there the alarms go off. That's not a good thing. I'm, I'm okay. I'm just in a plane. If I don't know the context, now I'm going to alarm and the system's useless because it's going to continue to alarm. So building systems that understand context, algorithms that can extract from accelerometers or all those other things that understand where I'm at, what am I doing? I'm at home, I'm in the bed, I'm in an aircraft, I'm in a... really is going to be necessary. So context is important. Artifacts are important. So sometimes artifact, motion artifact, and all those sorts of things look like the signal you're looking for. That's a problem. If the systems we build continually alarm inappropriately, people aren't going to use them. So the challenge we've got is that how do we collect that data, understand the data, and make sure that we have almost no false alarms with good positive outcomes. Huge challenge for us as sensor builders, device builders, all of those sorts of things. You've got to keep that in mind. Ultimately, remote monitoring needs trust, both from the users and the doctors, and assurance. Right? It's going to be all about trust. Doctors will adopt it if they trust in it. They won't if they don't. Okay? So we've got to build that trust. Engaging them early will help with that. I promise you this is the last video. This is one that I think we've all got to deal with privacy. Who here wants the, all of their data to end up on the internet tomorrow for everyone to look at? You don't want your medical history. <laughs> Only one person, great. Uh, I'll give you all clinical uh, trial <laughs> applications. But uh, I think um, one of the things we're going to be challenged here with is, is this issue of privacy. Yeah. 
Yes, I'd like to order. This is Mr. Cuddy? Yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number is 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you with a 736 Montrose Corp, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well... I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for those, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high blood pressure. You're going to be a national health care provider that allows you to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all the future claims of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67. $67? That includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now yeah, you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. <laughs> you could pay $48 if you ordered our special price. Let's go for the next to the very easy, sir. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67 then. You just bought those tickets from Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? <laughs> but I see you checked out the budget beach farm of the library last week. Hmm. Up to you, sir. Right, right. through to commercialization. So if I'm involved on the front end, I'm still involved with the thing on the back end. My job is just not this little piece. We're a team, and we're part of that team to, sol to solve that, that problem all the way through. Um, we strive to be successful and do great things. So by doing all these things, we think we're going to be successful, and in being successful, you energize the engineer or the people in the process. They see that their devices are in the field. The sense for baby devices are soon going to be in Mexico and mothers doing really great things and the engineers get to see it. So I think that drive that really inspires people. Um, and we're doing things to change the world really for better. I think that's really a great thing. Um, culture and future directions, we are a team. We're focused on reducing healthcare costs. We know that we have to succeed, otherwise the country is going to collapse. Uh, we can only do this by staying focused and working with the broader community. You know, we can't do this alone. We have to collaborate. We have to collaborate with universities, with companies, with institutes. We have to get involved as a community to solve these problems. If we don't do it, we're not going to succeed. So we need your help. We can't do it alone. That's it. I saw a hand up front. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I had a question, I guess. 
um, in terms of the privacy? Do you think it's that people are more fearful about what's going to be used with their information, or they actually care that much? Like, for instance, if you were to create a platform that would allow doctors to see other doctors' information at, online or something, do you think people would buy into it, or do you think that they don't, wouldn't care about something like that? I think I think that, that when you're dealing with humans, you quickly realize that everyone's different. So yeah. some people don't care, and some people are paranoid. And they're paranoid and don't care about different things. So I think that I personally think that ultimately, I've worked a lot with the military, and the military is great. They get told, you're going to do this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a choice. We don't have that in the broader community. So I think it comes down to providing perhaps people with a choice. Yeah. What, do you, what do you want done with this data? Do you mind if I, I decentralize it and provide it to its people? Do you want to see the data before I give it to anyone? That, that's, yeah. my, that's my big I'd yeah. love to know, right? I'd love to have this little system measuring when I put my toothbrush in and saying, you've got a cavity in model three, it's going to become a problem in six months, do you, really, do you want me to send that information to your dentist to have it analyzed? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no yes. So I'd like to be in control of my data, but if I'm getting 10,000 texts a day with that data, uh, I probably don't. So it, I think it's personalized. I think that's probably going to be the way we have to do it. All right. I'm going to go to the back of the room, Mark. Um, hi. Um, I was very interested and happy to hear you say you were very interested in collaborating with everybody. And of course, in this room, I think I can see probably at least a half a dozen projects that might be interesting from what you talked about. So I guess what I'm very much interested in is how do you guys see yourselves collaborating? I mean, you're new on the block. We'd certainly like to find some kind of system to be able to funnel ideas to you, maybe have you guys look at some of the things that we're doing and be able to triage some of those ideas. Kind of, you know, act as sort of that, you know, in that role of where you guys are seeing the big picture and helping people with the individual projects find a way to fit in. Right. Um, look, we've got two outwardly looking funnels that we're standing up right now. One of them is outwardly looking for those unmet needs with caregivers and providers. Um, it's not just the caregivers and providers, it's entrepreneurs, it's research groups. If some people have already identified a dynamic need, that's a channel that they can come into. We've also got another one, which is an outreach to solution providers, which are universities and groups that have cute, like the University of Illinois is a good example. We want to know who's doing the most cutting edge technology. We don't want to do that at the Institute unless we absolutely have to do it. We want to translate those fantastic solutions for an an unmet need that we've identified. So when we find an unmet need, we, we want to know, well, this group and this group are doing these fantastic things. We want to work with them to build the system. So yeah, talk to me afterwards, and we, we want to find out what people are doing. Yeah. We're standing there. I'd like to see a mechanism where we can kind of show you what's going on yeah. sort of a regular basis. Because I can tell you, we have a sensor guy here who's as good as those Illinois guys. Right. So let, <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a couple of people feel that way. Um, there's a student right here, and then I think I'm going to maybe take two more questions, and Robert, Dr. Matthews will be back this afternoon for the panel, so we can take some more of those questions. Go ahead. Hi, I'm an undergrad here at UCSD, mm -hmm. and um, I was wondering for the very, very, very long term, do you view um, your theory of the proactive care at home being something that will challenge the medical establishment, and that prices will continue to get high, and people are going to look for like radical You know, I think long term, we're all going to be responsible for our healthcare somewhat. You know, right now we kind of leave it to the system to look after ourselves. So I, I think that the home of the future will have a very intelligent latrine that will analyze stuff. It will be a standard and it will provide the information to, to help manage what we're doing. And I, I think the medical industry is going to have to adopt this. They, they see it coming too. It's not that they're naive to it. But we need places around our, our beds, our bathrooms, all of the places where we can non-invasively get data from people, I think is going to be the future. Okay. Just have one last question. Um, one with the lady. <laughs> I'll ask this question and, and maybe it'll be something that resonates with others. I'm working on some projects, the medical devices are very simple, easy to use, uh, targeting in this case neurologists, but it's easy enough that it
to have a doctor working for us who can write a prescription mm -hmm. that the patient takes to their neurologist because they're highly motivated to control something that is very expensive and painful for them. If, it, if that doctor could be anywhere in the country and we could just have a drop down menu on the internet, it would really help. This is, I mean, these are some of the, and I've seen four devices now where we're all confronting the same challenge. So you'd like to see a database of physicians or something that you had we access to? No, legally, if we had a, a doctor available to us who could write a prescription, they could pull it off the internet and the patient anywhere in the country could, could have the, uh, we could fill it for them or they could take it to their doctor and have it automatically filled. So I don't quite understand your question. It, well, um, I agree with everything you said, yeah. but I, 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 I'm, I'm just throwing out that, um, that if in your collaborating with folks who are in the same predicament that we're in, you can't figure out which market segment is going to work. Um, some it, ways to get to overcome the barriers so that we just don't go direct to over the counter, which is kind of crapshoot and based on how much advertising we have. It's not changing patient-oriented. Yeah, it, look, it's, it's one of the big challenges, right? If you don't have that person, those doctors who are saying, I'm shaking at the bit to have this, and I'm going to prescribe it, and I'm going to do that, finding those people and making that happen is really a huge challenge. So um, we can talk a little bit later, if you like, so I get a better understanding of your challenges. Well, I guess I'm also suggesting publish your case studies so more and more doctors get excited about looking for these technologies. And they don't just have to go to one of the things that we validate that we're trying to get going is that companies can come to us, we'll validate the technology, we're a not-for-profit independent institution, and then people can look to us for validated technologies. Well, Dr. Matthews, again, thank you so much for starting our